I'm glad. I love this comment. Thank you everyone for coming. The talk will be in English. I hope that's fine for everyone. Um, and thanks for coming on the survey, like hot or spill day, as you say in German. Um, maybe we all feel a little bit under the weather, but we will try our best in the conversation now. And uh, thank you all for coming. From New York slash Marseille, um, you're based between New York and Marseille, or here and there. So it's a pleasure to be here in the exhibition. Um, and the exhibition yeah, opened in, in June. We had some of the artists already here in the house. So the artists who were involved in this exhibition would have the Taken Shapes, Arbor Allison, to my left, Ben Harry Hachmeister, Bruno Smolka, Bruno Penka, Emmanuel Diefu, and Tomi Schmale. And if you'd like, and uh, if you want to stay a little longer, you can also do like a Tour, like guided tours through the exhibition afterwards to also talk about the broader concept and, and the other similar works. But now I'm very happy to like, go a little bit more in depth about your work that we see right behind us. So um, thank you, Walda, for, for being here below. So just to yeah, introduce very quickly your practice now. Where you're coming from, you start in art college, where you finish in A16. You had shown also in Cologne um, because you were representing my dad in the So um, one day you'll get a solo exhibition there. Um, so yeah, we're very happy to have you back here. Um, you work with the painting and with text, and what I think is very like unique to your approach of your way of working is that your body of work with abstract paintings is very formal, almost like very rigid formal austerity, but then the process that it's driven by is highly conceptual. So you reference from a very specific linguistic approach and from literature. So yeah, I would like to hear about your process and why you're like getting your process yeah. done. Uh, well, the paintings in the show are part of a large body of work that I don't think of as serial exactly, but they started in 2014 when I was reading um, a text by my critic called The Lesbian Body, which is originally in French. And um, what told me about this text was that um, the take, um, well, actually, the translator of this text chose to um, make an intervention in the take's textual intervention. Um, she makes it into the eye. She inserts the, the slash in the eye in the original text of the show is split. And she writes about this as being related to the impossibility of the feminine subject existing in language. Um, and this text is about this kind of culture of women that I, I believe is based on um, ideas about lesbos and sappho. Um, it's quite violent and erotic, and each page is kind of a vignette about this culture, and so um, you, could, you can kind of enter it at, at any point, it's not exactly a living narrative. Um, and I discovered this text at the same time I had been working in many different ways. I had a lot of um, but at the time I read this, I had found these wool army blankets and um, somehow like interleaved the idea of this slash of the text with um, this kind of cutting structure that I developed. Um, alongside uh, a dyeing process I was, I was doing with this wool. I mean, I had other material at the time, but mostly now it's wool. So, um, what specifically was intriguing to me about this text was that in the translation the, into English, that is, the, the I in the text is italicized, so it kind of constitutes this cut throughout the entire text, um, almost obliterating itself in the process um, as it, as it um, yeah, it's just right for that. Um, so, yeah, over, over the past several years, um, I have been working on other things, but at a certain point, I, I sort of deeply investigated this process and um, started a much larger body of work of these wool paintings. Um, the first ones I made in 2014 were quite rudimentary compared to these. They were single panels that were horizontal and actually quite large, but um, they didn't even have like a central cut in them. Um, so, they were quite Basic and in the, in the meantime, I have like, built much more complex structures for these pieces. Um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, the process that I, that, or should I talk about the process now? Yes. 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 Um, basically, um, the studio situation is like a, a sort of set up with dye pots and then heating these dyes that um, uh, require acid to fix them. Um, they heat and they, they do work rather quickly, so kind of soak them pieces of wool. And there's a lot of steps of washing fabric and many different stages of the, the dyeing process. Um, and essentially each component of the, the pieces um, is dyed with a very rudimentary, almost like abstract typographical structure that kind of resembles like a, an eye, like a straight eye. Um, and once I've sort of like dyed many pieces at once, you know, over, over the course of several days or several weeks, um, I go to this process of cutting and you know, assembling these works, um, mostly based on schematic dynamics that I make on paper and also in Photoshop. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of an uncanny process to me. Um, I think about the notion of sacred geometry or sort of discovering this um, basic sort of mathematical operation that feels results. And ultimately I think of this as a kind of lexicon of abstract characters um, that can sort of um, move alongside the idea of language or, um, or letters or some other typography that you know, don't, don't constitute a, a spoken language. It's not verbal, like very tactile language. But I find very interesting because also, um, I don't know if you experienced the same when you approach the paintings for the first time and you, you look at them from afar, they seem to be very like um, plain, like as if it's like paintings, like in a like more uh, formal or regular hanging process on canvas, and you don't even realize the cuts not only being like straight lines in the geometrical abstraction. But being like cuts that are soon. So I think that is really interesting too when you get closer, you just see the texture, you see the wool texture, you see of course the bleeding of colors that also tell about the dyeing process. And then uh, you see the stitching that is very accurate also. Um, you, yeah, it's, it doesn't look like any craft from, from afar. So, um, and it also tells about collage, of course. And I think. You just mentioned that this um, process of you dyeing the wool and then cutting them and stitching them together um, offers like plenty of new possibilities and recommend, which is even like almost mathematical. So I see it in your work and in your approach also as a way to think of a body, a body of work, but also of the physical body and body of identities um, in a very fragmented way. So maybe we talk about this process of like fragments and how you then kind of make this, because this is very interesting that you still, in the final result, you put it on like a, um, uh, what is it? Well, the yeah, exactly. So there's like the, the end form, the form you find, the, Especially we're sitting in the analysis called like um, taking shapes, so the shape that's taken at the end is kind of a classical painting. So yeah, yeah. So how how is this like the process of like, to to understand the painting, to work with the painting, and um, yeah, what does it offer for you in terms of configurations and, and refigurations? Um. Yeah, I mean, the stretch of our start, of course, like what finalizes the image and makes it appear as a painting and also allows you to see it as potentially like actual images when you're far away from it. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I have this kind of strange relationship with painting. I mean, I've never been like a painter in like a rendering sense, or I mean, I never, I mean, I did study painting in graduate school, but I did not study painting. In a technical sense. Um, so I've always felt like a bit of an imposter, but also like enjoyed this position of uh, creating these sort of, I knew they're like objects that can drag, that 
in the glare of light when you're just painting, and then there's this kind of like flipping that or flickering that happens in between when you see them up close and far away, um, where you like that in the bridge of the and the bridge. Um, and people do often ask me when they are in my studio and see the booth's wool pieces because they're quite lush and I mean, it's like more like a rainbow in the studio because I'm working on many pieces at once and they're all kind of reflecting each other. Um, I think of them as having like a viral relationship with themselves or like sort of amongst the body of different works because of the way that the dye is imparted into the material, the way that the dye is removed from the bath but like is also kind of imparted invisibly into the fabric um, and transfers amongst like many different works. Um, I'm losing the of your question a little bit. No, I think you asked me perfectly fine. And at least I like, could, yeah, go to your answer. But if there's only a specific thing, you can drop your I will <laughs> lead the direction of, and maybe to, to its colors, because um, the process you are working with uh, naturally opens a kind of like relation between the different series of works, and I don't even I mean, you're not even using this like term of the work series, but um, you can see that there's like um, red threads going through because, of course, it's from the same kind of color family, color scheme family. Um, so maybe you could talk about your combination of colors and the composition in your paintings, and then maybe. Let's uh, bring it to a more like theoretical level or metaphorical level. Um, I understand your paintings in terms of like color and connection, therefore, as like kind of like what you would call like chosen families or like a family yeah. thing that is like evolving around those relations between them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the color question is a bit. Challenging because it's very associative and intuitive for me, and it's also kind of my entry point is making art in the first place from like a very young age. Um, in this work, I mean, these works in the show are very specific in terms of the color, you know, they are sort of going together, but um, even I'm not, I'm not necessarily making like 10 paintings of the same color scheme, for instance, it's usually like. Uh, pretty vastly different themes, like you know, within the same kind of um, phase of like making the paintings, just for some context. Um, and the colors, I, I mean, I'm, I'm usually like, I mean, it can be just sort of an intuitive combination of coming up with. I, I think of them in relation to the sort of abstract systems of notation, like musical notation. Yeah, thinking of the color combinations of like kinds of chords or something like that, these sort of very uh, forceful, just like sensory tactile moments. Um, I mean, sometimes I'm sampling colors from just a photograph I take or something that I see. Um, but what I'm especially interested in is reproducing these works because um, they are kind of very reproducible. I mean, each of these panels. And in all of these, um, these works here, and by the time I mean like, like a quarter of one of these two panels is like one of the rectangles. Um, so each of these rectangles starts off as two strips, and they are all dyed the same sort of original color scheme. But of course, I can't really control how the dye lands on the fabric, and that's something I mean, of course I am working with. Um, but that means that I can. Yeah, I can reproduce the works many times and it always come up with these sort of different almost animated results. And um, I mean, in that sense, I think of these as characters where they can be handwriting, where you can know each other that you make is legible but not ever in the same as the um, And actually, these paintings are the color scheme is based on another work that I made that, that almost made it into the show but did it, but it's like. It's roughly the same color scheme, but because I've been dying for it at different times, like the colors are quite different. So, I mean, if they were next to each other, the, the other words are, are basically the same as these two, but like different color scheme. Um, and actually, there's like even some some bleed in the back, so like, like that kind of very red paint. Um, 
But, but if you were to see them together, it would be like super disappointing kind of experience because the colors are like based on each other, but they don't sort of appear. Um, I mean, I think that it's maybe not such a pleasant experience to be meant to like see this, this contrast. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this reproduction is something that I'm interested in working more with. I found all these sorts of them in a few iterations so far. Those words were newly be used in this year, 2023, mm -hmm. and at the Schloss of the Friedrich Wilker. So, also welcome to uh, another artist who is there in Messerschmitt right now. Um, nice to have you here from Wilker. Thank you. So, like, maybe that's just like a basic question, uh, that, or like a spontaneous question right now, because we talked before when you arrived, we talked about Massey, we talked about Cologne, we talked about New York, we talked about New York. Briefly, and I also ask you where you're based, and, or if you if you would say you're still based in New York, and you were a little hesitant, and then because you will be back in Europe this year also, so maybe just like to to refer to this, like if the place where you're staying is like kind of informing the color composition, and if yes. In how far, or specifically, also the paintings that we have in front of us? Right. Um, I mean, I think yes, but I, I don't know if I can explain it very well, or like in a way that's interesting. Um, I think it's it's like, uh, I mean, I do have, you know, like equipment and stuff that I have to move around, which is you know, uh, logistically challenging, but um, this practice is also very global. As a, you know, the paintings appear at the end when they're stretched and so before and you know, they're like pieces of fabric that like, fold and roll and it's um, you know, quite easy to disseminate in a certain sense. Um, I think, yeah, I, mean, I think the colors are, I mean, it's, it's like an effective experience. It's both like coming from whatever bring into my mood at a certain period or like in a certain period, like broadly speaking, and also like very specifically. The dye into the box, which I can't really see the results of until I put the fabric in. And so there's like this sort of things to find as well to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there is an aspect of these that is quite related to landscape and nature. So, of course, when I'm in a place that has like nature and proximity in you know, the sea, I've, I've made a lot of these paintings like, in places where I'm like, next to the sea. Yeah. It's, it's resonant, but it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can say anything very specific about like how that informs the work. In a way, it's beyond you know, just my intuition or how it feels. So, um, let's maybe talk about the abstraction as, um, as potential, and I'm quoting now from the previous issue of Pieces of Kunst. Who is um, shedding light to like trans perspectives? And I quote from um, like, a, like an essay um, trans, trans perspectives and um, trans abstractions to celebrate liberations that is like um, revolving around the work of Yang Yang Huang and Kian Williams, who are mainly sculptures. But um, I think what is really interesting, and um, I'm also going this way. Like, latest publication here. Um, it's like a reading or a rereading of abstraction as a weird practice and um, a potential to conceive of social gender as something mutable and multiple without directly representing bodies in terms of a queer representational aesthetic. So that's somehow also what we try to show and bring together in this exhibition here. That is like all the artists that we write are dealing in a very biographical sense with the queerness and queer bodies and queer or trans or non binary identities, but it's uh, not so obvious in the work in the, in the first place. So it's much more about um, defining our forms, the taking of shapes, um, and how this like, very personal, identical um, issue is translating into a medium or a material in contemporary art. And of course, it's nothing new and like, uh, yeah, it's been 
sent this already, and I'm really like, yeah, just recommending this book that I'm also quoting a little bit later. Um, that is called Breaking the Wave: The Abstract and Contemporary Art by Lex Long and Lancaster. So I think this kind of reading is very interesting for your work. Um, so this, um, yeah, this this kind of potential of abstraction to talk about like queer identities without kind of fulfilling this um, almost also ex excluding the voyeuristic state of mind where you have like a photographic uh, work that is really like um, about representation. So um, yeah, how do you how do you use abstraction for your and um, also very conceptual approaches? Mm -hmm. um. Well, I, I mean, I think on a very basic level, sometimes I think of these because I mostly have been working in diptychs, more like this piece. Um, these works are actually like a, a newer format of the four panels are smaller. Um, but uh, sort of like thinking of them as uh, these kind of invented like chromosomal structures or something like facetious versions of like X, X, or X, Y, or something, which I mean is rather like obvious. Certainly. Um, I think, um, I mean, I've never been, I mean, I think, I think a lot of the ways I work are in a way like a kind of affirmation, which I mean is relevant to the history of like how I do homosexuality is constructed in the first place, because it's like against homosexuality or like transness, it's like against, you know, it's just, yes. Um, and, and by that, I, I guess I think like the, the places that I arrive in my work are, are like kind of this process of elimination of like all the stuff that I don't want to do, um, it's like this deviation. Um, and um, just like arriving at processes that are the most rudimentary to me in, in terms of my background. Um, I mean, and then I think the experience of making these works has kind of like strangely obliterated the language that I have for them. Um, so even as I feel the work becomes stronger, I feel like I become more clumsy in talking about it. Um, like it's sort of taken over or something. Um, because it, it was much easier to talk about them like when I first started some of them. Um, and I think that yeah, somehow the, the question of um, gender and like sort of embodiment within speech and language are very related to me because I I think that um, yeah I mean I have to make these words in order to embody like certain ideas that I don't feel that I can encapsulate so efficiently in language and um, that's a tool for me and uh, I can kind of show Yeah, just like very broad possibility of the kind of implementation of that. I mean, these are like very like shattered sort of um, compositions, and they're. I mean, I think of them as. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort of constructing these letter forms that could constitute something like. <laughs> Gender, but I don't know. I mean, this question is very hard, actually. <laughs> Even though it's like um, it's very fundamental to the work, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have a very strong answer. You also don't have to, to answer it like properly. I can just, as an art historian, just like give my quotes and like relate yeah, it to the yeah, work. Like, and you can have to with the interests and your interpretations because, um, yeah, it, it's sort of like. Yeah, I think that the paintings act as like the kind of mirror in a way. I mean, I think not just for me, but like in my experience, like people reacting to them and seeing them in the gallery. And that's that, um, I mean, they're like slow burn, like it takes some time to see what's happening and the kind of like sickness of them. Um, the 
was like all the poets were circulating and um, creating these illusions of space and depth that, that don't really exist. I mean, you can maybe sort of imagine that the, the things are woven together and that there's like that material that doesn't actually exist in the space and stuff. And somehow, I mean, I feel this expansiveness is very related to gender identifications that Moving on to the primary. That's maybe, um, let me just quote, like, I saw my sister from this uh, very early book, who says, um, when writing about abstraction, I'm constantly pressed up against the limited language and attuned to how words fail plainly, while abstraction breaks away from representation, it also resists the description of those problems I'm wanting to gestures. Kind of, um, yeah. Whereas you thank you very much with uh, what you said and also with, with your work when I, when I saw this. Um, so, one last question I would have about language in relation to your titles, your work titles, because um, you should grab the floor plan later, so it gets more clear how it's written because I cannot, I mean, uh, I, would, I, would say, <laughs> maybe, I just wanted to say, maybe you read them now, because I would just say, I would say, is it, I mean, I would read it. Larry's grip in the rose, off and over the rice, for example. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, yeah. You're not wrong, it's just like, it's, it's, speech is insufficient. So, I mean, that's exactly the, yeah, that was like the, how to demonstrate this. What, 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 what is the, what, what is the most fun? That is very wrong, I can't go through this book. <laughs> so, um, what is the most fun? QED, so, um, oh, yeah. sure. So this, your titles are, you use exactly this monolithic kind of style of like using the slash yeah. to, um, to replace the I yeah. in this case. Yeah, it's, uh, so, um, and then you also work with the spacing. So when you see the um, title in the first place, you think the layout or the, yeah, it's kind of odd, um, but yeah, you, you really um, you re really work with those like unexpected breaks and um, also missing things and uh, so yeah. Would you would you like to, to speak about how you how and when the title is coming in? Yeah, because that would be also interesting to hear. If it's like if you have yeah, if it's independent from your works and then you bring them together or yeah, how you yeah. Uh, yeah how the process is. Like. Well, as you may remember, um, sometimes I make this extremely last minute. I know. <laughs> but I didn't know if that's always the case. No. Well, um, yeah, I mean, the titles I'm kind of trying to reproduce the experience of like seeing the paintings, the sort of optical experience in the text, um, because they're kind of jarring and not um, really descriptive. Although the titles do usually contain some kind of reference to the color. I think that's not but I'm generally I'm not interested in making titles that have like a less of a relationship to the painting or vice versa. It's more like they're meant to go alongside each other or sort of like share a certain space. Um, and I, I mean, I do often leave works on title for a long time to like the titles, but I don't really like leaving them on title because they're also very hard to describe, like to distinguish them from each other, which is just kind of a problem like with this um, but yeah, I mean, the, the titles are, um, yeah, I, I just sort of think those are from a variety of sources. And then I have like various sources of just like text fragments that I collect from things I'm leaving. Or like, I was looking at like a moth identification guide for titles for a while because moths look really strange names. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, they're not, um, they're not meant to be like descriptive as much as experiential. The slashes, because they're kind of like, the slashes almost act as um, an analog to the spacing, so it's like you can kind of like flip in or out of like looking at the slashes or the spacing as the 
other divisions have been on the line. Does that make sense? I mean, it's almost like how you can either see in the paintings like the, um, the kind of figures that are constructed by the, the colors being like matching each other in certain places um, versus the, the construction of the scenes themselves and like the shapes that does that make sense? I mean, it's a bit tricky to describe that, but I think it's, it's, it's a pretty distinct experience of the paintings. Great. Um, maybe I would like to open up to the audience now. We are all here. And um, first of all, before we do that, I have little thank you notes. Um, first of all, to Lisa, thank you for your support here also for the show. Um, that uh, yeah, that takes place um, at, at Lohnhof Deutz um, here at Kunstwerk, thanks to the whole team, uh, Johannes, Erika, and uh, Michael for um, yeah, helping us install and all the support, Nima. Then uh, thank you to Adam Klein, who's doing here also um, a co great show with, and um, to all the famous artists here. And the exhibition is funded by the Jewish Home of the Forum, so yeah. thanks to them. Um, so, and now thanks to the audience, and maybe, um, yeah, just to open it um, for questions to provide. Uh, are you going to keep the word in the uh, like, your process you're doing now? Or? Are you thinking about changing in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't keep working with it, but it, um, the sort of each phase of working, I mean, the sort of batch of paintings I make kind of represents like a shift in the compositions that I come up with, so um, it's not, it doesn't feel so consistent or like it's very repetitive. Um, I mean, now I'm, I'm interested in expanding the pieces have more sort of panels like this. I mean, I'm interested in the kind of mega space that emerges with combining four different panels, but, but not necessarily like the same color scheme on all four, maybe like two and two. I recently had a show in Rome where I had three pieces that were horizontal, composed of like two different sets of pairs that were around the size of the number of um, So, yeah, I mean, I think I will engage with construction. Also on a larger scale. I mean, I think these, um, I don't know, I mean, I hesitate to think of them as serial because of what's most interesting to me and I think what is most revealing is to see many of them work together because you start to be able to learn about the process more than you can just see one. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like, yeah, they have these sort of internal syntax. Hi, um, I was wondering what your relationship to wool material is, since it's a kind of special material to dye, it's not yeah. that easy, and it uh, takes a broader process to handle. Yeah. And the other question is, do you as well write, and if the writing looks likewise the uh, pilots? Um. I mean, I do, I do write in a way, but it's, um, it's all very formalized outside of the titles at this point. I mean, I, I have, I, my work up until like 2017, 2018 had a lot of text like directly in it and it was quite fragmentary. I mean, the text was like very efficient in a certain way, so. Um, and I mean, this work that I think of as like being a very direct descendant of that work, but it's not so obvious like aesthetically. Um, and with respect to the wool, um, I, yeah, I mean, I always wanted textiles from when I was young. I mean, I, I didn't go to art school properly. I mean, I went to a school with like a strong art program, but it wasn't something where I like received a lot of technical education. So I ended up relying a lot of my skills that I developed more like in childhood and um, 
Yeah, I mean, the reason that I was able to continue this work actually after like finding these army blankets from the very beginning. Um, I mean, at which point I didn't know where to find more material because well, it's not so easy to find in fabric form, um, as I suspect you might know. Um, I, yeah, I, mean, I just I remember this woolen mill that my grandmother took me to as a child in New Hampshire. And, um, it's you know, it's quite like rustic. Uh, and I'm always afraid it's going to like shut down. I've also had a really hard time finding other wool in, in Europe until recently. Um, because I think to find something nice it's just very expensive. But I it works quite I mean um, yeah, and I've always worked in textile, so the, the the malleability is like quite important for me and also is so integral to the stretching process because you know if you wear wool you understand how it can kind of like mold to your body like the gravity process of wearing it. Um, it's you know it's flexible like I don't think I can easily reproduce these structures with the same flatness of like cotton canvas or, or whatnot. Um, and and I think it's I mean I get frustrated by how easy it is to forget that it's wool, that it's like from an animal, but that's also like very important and it's like part of my idea of like the kind of violence about language and the body that um, um, you know, like the wool is quite processed at this stage. Um, and I you know it's very hard to find information about supply chain and stuff like this textiles. So I don't really know a lot about the origins of it, which disturbs me. Um, yeah, I think that sort of like alienation that comes out in this sort of instant apprehension of this as a canvas and then like realizing it's actually, you know, it's from the body. And I also like that it kind of makes the surface a bit less determined because it's fuzzy, like their hair just sort of like stick out from the surface and it's not really like flat, it's almost like the, the surface occupies more space. It's part of uh, the challenging the notion that you know, painting is really like two dimensional. I mean, which is also the case in the seams and the fact that like the construction of the paintings requires the seams, which means that part of them goes to the back and you know, it's all kind of like circulating around itself. And also the color goes all the way through the It's like a screen. I think um, this was a very interesting um, and that has been a main focus in my career because in the recent years I was researching a lot of it that um, textile is um, or has been always has been like a medium that is very fluid as you say in that um, sense also it's like it has a front and a back but it's a kind of yeah you can change it it's floating and it's uh, easy to fragment them to sew together it's um, yeah all those qualities that are textile um, can play to queer identity and bodies so I think there's also now in one of my art a huge rise of textile medium becoming so yeah. there are a lot of like in the last five years I would say um, first of all uh, a rise of handcraft again after the school digital era yeah. so suddenly it's like clay ceramics is everywhere yeah. Textiles everywhere, and um, so I think this quality of textiles, yeah, kind of telling a lot about um, queer qualities, also in a material sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like almost immediate. Sometimes, I mean, lately I felt like very lucky to work with textiles. Like, I mean, it's just like kind of looking into this. I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from the audience? If not, we can also just break the silence 
and uh, we're going to have a drink and there are plenty of other fish um, and have a more like intimate conversation rather than the video. So, mm -hmm. uh, more hours. Um, so, yeah, please, yeah, let's meet at the bar and if you like, I think there's a time I would say um, that in, I don't know, 20 minute break or something and then we could like gather again in the space and have a little like added informal tour with Alan. Thanks for coming and we have a lovely day. <laughs>